Hello good people, today we will be talking about early and medieval Japan, a time period that spans the years of 600 to 1333 AD. Here are the goals for this video. Uh, take a moment to read over them and make sure that you can answer them all by the time you're done listening. So the first thing you'll notice about the geography of Japan if you look at it on a map, is that it is a chain of islands. Uh, it's got four main islands and many smaller islands, and all of these together add up to be about as big as the state of Montana. So in spite of its enormous historical significance, Japan is actually quite small. The fact that it's a chain of islands and that it's 125 miles away from the nearest point of the Asian mainland means that it is more or less isolated from uh, from developments on the Asian mainland. But that means that, one, it's safe from outside threats. It's hard to invade because you need lots of boats. It also means that Japan is able to develop its own unique culture. And even though they import certain ideas from the mainland, they're able to take these ideas and develop them into uniquely Japanese uh, cultural creations. Uh, on top of being a chain of islands, Japan is also composed largely of volcanic mountains. And this has certain effects. First, volcanic, vi volcanoes make the soil extremely rich because volcanic eruptions spread around uh, certain chemicals that are good for the soil and that make the soil very fertile. Uh, but it also limits the amount of land that you can farm because it's very hard to farm on mountains themselves. So this means that Japan has a little, very little arable land, but that this arable land is extremely rich and can support a high population density. This is important for Japanese society where people tend to live in small areas with very high population density and leads to a very tight-knit community. Uh, Another thing that the geography of Japan leads to is that it's difficult to unify a chain of mountains and islands. Mountains make passage over land difficult, and the fact that there are so many different little islands means it's easy for different lords to control different chunks of land. Uh, and you'll see on the next slide that the unification of Japan is, for a very long time, a kind of up in the air. The most important trend in Japanese political history is the constant struggle between centralizing rulers and decentralizing aristocrats. Centralizing rulers want to make it so that they and their government can control the entire territory of Japan. But the decentralizing aristocrats, that is powerful local landowners that want to be left alone, resist the attempts of the ruler to centralize and try to keep as much power as they can in their own hands. This struggle defines Japanese political history. In 680, a centralizing ruler adopts Chinese practices and declares himself the supreme ruler of all of Japan. And from 600 to 800, these guys, these centralized rulers who call themselves emperors, control Japan. They effectively uh, exert their power over the aristocrats. However, uh, from 800 to 1100, the central government begins to lose power and the aristocrats uh, begin to become more independent. This leads eventually to constant warfare between different groups in Japan. The aristocrats, because they no longer have to listen to the emperor, begin to fight among each other and we get a period of long-lasting civil war. Uh, from 1100 to 1333, this state of civil war is brought to the end by strong military rulers. These guys are called shoguns. They uh, claim power in the name of the emperor and reduce the freedom of the aristocrats, therefore effectively centralizing Japan. They rule in the name of the emperor, but really the emperor has very little power, and it's the shogun, aka this leading general who has all the real power. After 1333, uh, the shoguns begin to lose power and decentralization uh, begins again. 
So the cycle begins to repeat itself. The medieval period in Japan was similar to feudal Europe in a way, in that society was divided up into different classes and that these classes uh, relied on each other to fulfill certain obligations. At the top of the pyramid was the emperor, who was supposedly the supreme ruler of all Japan, and he gave authority to regional rulers who ruled in his name. The aristocrats, or the regional rulers, were local lords who sometimes supported and other times opposed the emperor. Sometimes they fought among themselves and ignored the emperor's calls for unity. The samurai, perhaps the most famous social strata of this period, were professional soldiers who fought for the aristocrats and who followed the warrior code of Bushido. Basically, every samurai worked for one aristocrat or another aristocrat, and he dedicated his life to the service of this person. And the warrior code of Bushido stressed certain qualities that uh, would lead somebody to become a, an especially effective samurai. So basically, if you're an aristocrat, you would want your professional soldiers to follow this code, which taught such values as courage, honor, and loyalty. And this code was taken extremely seriously by the samurai. In fact, those who violated this code in any way were expected to and often did perform the ritual of seppuku, in which the samurai would perform a ritual suicide in order to remove the dishonor brought upon him by his breach of the code. And this involved him stabbing himself in the gut with a small samurai sword. And then, sometimes, his best buddy would chop his head off to end his suffering more quickly. They took their honor very seriously, obviously. And at the bottom of the social code, or its social strata, just like everywhere else, were the people who actually made all the stuff. The peasants, the farmers, the fishers, the merchants, and the craftsmen. They were required to work and to pay taxes to the local lords. Um, and in return, the local lords would protect them from bandits and stuff if that happened to occur. religious traditions that developed in Japan, and they actually coexisted and blended together in a number of interesting ways. And the first one of these traditions, which developed uh, originally in Japan, was called Shinto, which means the sacred way. And the core belief in Shinto is that all nature is divine. They don't so much believe in like a heavenly world that's removed from the natural world, but rather they believe that nature itself is spiritual and significant. Uh, they believe that the natural world is filled with mysterious supernatural powers. And on top of that, they believe that these supernatural powers can uh, manifest as spirits, which they call kami, and that these kami live in the world alongside people. The power of the spirits, they believed, could be sensed and tapped into through living a virtuous life and also through performing certain religious ceremonies that celebrated the beauty and the mystery of the natural world. Uh, on top of inhabiting the natural world, like mountains and rivers and streams and stuff like that, they also believed that the uh, magical forces, or miraculous forces, inhabited the everyday domestic life and also the political world. So they believed that even the home was a spiritual place where the spirits dwelt and where you could sense the divine power of the world. They also believed that the emperor uh, was divine and related in some way to the kami. Uh, one of the coolest things about Shinto is that they would build shrines and rather than the, like churches or mosques that kind of sealed people off from the world into this own sacred spot, uh, the Shinto shrines celebrated a particularly beautiful or spiritually powerful place. And you can see pictures there. And by performing rituals at these shrines, it was believed you could call up the spiritual power of the world and experience it there for yourself. of Japan was Buddhism, and this was imported from Korea around 700 AD. 
And there were two major Japanese varieties that appealed to different parts of Japanese society. Uh, the first was known as Zen Buddhism. And Zen Buddhism focused not so much on uh, the Buddha himself or on bodhisattvas or on any particular belief, but rather it focused on the practice of meditation. And it focused more on how you meditate and how you live your life than on what you believe. And the reason meditation was so important in Zen Buddhism is that they believed that you could use meditation to free your mind from attachment to yourself. And by freeing your mind from attachment to yourself, uh, this would allow you to live as a free person who could act spontaneously rather than according to some kind of false idea of who you actually were. And uh, this type of Buddhism became very popular among the samurai, and the samurai actually came to believe that practicing meditation and Zen Buddhism could make them superior swordsmen and superior archers, so that by clearing the mind of fear and attachment, one could become perfectly at one with the bow or with the sword. The other strain of Buddhism that developed in Japan was known as Pure Land Buddhism, and in this strain, uh, Basically, people didn't worry about meditation, and they focused solely on this one particular divine being, who was known as Amida, or Amita, or Amitabha, depending on how you want to say it. But so they basically believed that all you needed to do to take care of yourself was to pray to Amida, so that after you died, you would be reborn in a paradise known as the Pure Land. And there you would get to live for thousands of years until eventually you attained enlightenment and stopped existing altogether. And this strain of Buddhism was particularly popular among the peasants. Uh, and I guess you can imagine that this would be a nice idea if you spent your whole life working really hard and living in a dirty hut somewhere. Uh, and there's a picture of Zen monks practicing meditation, and you'll notice that they stare at a wall. And the point of that is that by staring at a wall, it prevents them from getting distracted and thinking about other stuff than their meditation. Which kind of brings about the end of this period in Japanese history. And there were actually two attempts by the Mongols to invade Japan, uh, one in 1274 and one in 1281. Uh, but both attempts were thwarted primarily by storms that destroyed most of the Mongol invasion fleet. These storms were called by the Japanese the kamikaze, which means the divine wind. You can see in there the word kami, which is the Shinto word for spirits. So the Japanese seem to believe that the spirits that inhabit the natural world intervened to save Japan from invasion by the Mongols. Uh, one thing that this causes is it forces Japan to maintain a high level of military readiness. They have to spend a lot of their money on their military uh, because they never know if the Mongols are going to attempt to invade them again later. Uh, because the military becomes so strong as a result of the Mongol invasions, it leads to the decline of the central government because the aristocrats are very powerful and can control their own territory without having to worry about what the emperor says or wants. And so this causes, in 1333, the decline back into decentralization that will last for a while until the early modern period in Japan. So there are the goals for the video. Thanks for listening. I hope you found it interesting. See you tomorrow.